Happy New Year. So glad it is 2021. I'm so glad we're done with the dumpster fire of 2020. I've missed your faces. I haven't seen you since last year. I know, cheesy dad joke, but I'm a dad. We've got a quota we gotta reach. But I know that you, just like me, are excited for this new year, for what God has, for what God's going to be doing in 2021, and to see how God works in and through Anchor. Uh, go ahead and get ready. We're getting ready to start our lesson here shortly. So go ahead and prepare as we get ready.
Hey, good morning, Anchor family. Man, it is my great privilege today to be the first person to get to welcome you into Anchor Church here. Corey's great. We're glad he introduced that, but I get to welcome you into the official start of our first service here at Anchor Church here in 2020 or 21. Uh, what, what a great year. We might look at this past year and have been discouraged in some ways, but I tell you, we've got some great things on the horizon coming up at Anchor Church, and we are certain that God is not done working in us as a church. He's starting brand new things. So at the beginning of this new year, whether you think this is an arbitrary time that doesn't matter, or you're one of those pers- people that just says, Man, this is the year we're going to go for it. I'm going to have a restart, a reset. I'm going to do some great things this year. Let's walk into this time just expectant, knowing that God's going to do some great things. We're going to sing about some of those great things as we begin to worship here, singing about seeing a victory through Christ.
is so great to worship with you, to sing the praises of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Now, as we prepare to get into God's Word, as we start a new year, let's start off on the right foot, remembering, rooting ourselves in the fact that we belong to Jesus, that our identity is in Him now. So watch this video. As we begin a new year, sometimes we can't help but look back at the past. But I'd like you to do something a little different. I'd like for you to reflect on what God has done in the year 2020. Now, some families who were separate and spending too much time apart were forced together to forge a greater relationship. Some people had to reevaluate what really matters in life and the work-family life balance was brought back into alignment through 2020. We had many opportunities to help people in the community. We helped people at Anchor Church with rent assistance, utility bills, Christmas, Thanksgiving, wonderful meals, and help along the way with relief on certain bills. And God was so good to supply all of our physical needs in 2020. And he's also supplied for us everything that we need for life and godliness. In 2020, we got to see people come to faith in Jesus, uh, baptizing people before the pandemic, in the pandemic, and all the way through. We got to see former people who were far from the Lord and lived a lifestyle that clearly indicated that they were far from the Lord, get close to Jesus and see their lives transformed. We dedicated so many children to the Lord. We even flew to Los Angeles. Jair and I last year flew to LA because Claudia gave her life to Jesus. And just days later, we flew out to baptize her in the ocean and then fly home that very same day. In fact, I want you to join with me in watching this video of Claudia's baptism with a couple of pictures that will follow. It's a real quick one, but this is Claudia getting baptized.
and over her baptism. What a joy that was. And these pictures of just true excitement for her new life in Christ. As we gather together here online, we can celebrate with her life that was transformed by Jesus. Oh, I'm so thankful that God did that work. I'm so thankful that he was still active in 2020. And so I cannot help but think of and hope for a great future in 2021. You know, last year, if you evaluate how much time you spent with the Lord, what books of the Bible did you read? How much time did you spend journaling and reflecting? How much time did you spend worshiping? How much time did you spend going to church, whether online or in person or helping people out? Now you have a, a baseline for what to expect in 2021. And, and wouldn't it be great to come before God and as you maybe make a, a resolution, a commitment this year to think about growing closer to God in this season. And as we start to cycle forward and into a new year that hopefully will not be plagued by COVID as 2020 was, we could be very tempted to chase after and run after old habits and old lifestyles and old pursuits and old goals and old vision for our life. But I believe God's doing a new thing and he wants to do a new thing in our lives. So take a look with us today in the book of Isaiah chapter 43, because we're going to see that God had a plan for Israel to do a new thing. And we are going to gather together and rally, maybe even around Paul's words in Philippians to think about pressing forward, having an upward call, looking forward. Uh, look with me real quick on the screen in Philippians chapter 3 verses 13 through 14, as you earmark your passage in Isaiah. Uh, Paul wrote, and he said, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul had his gaze fixed upon heaven. He was looking forward to what is ahead. He wasn't dwelling on the past or his mistakes or the difficulty from the last year. No, his life was positioned in such a way to dwell on heavenly thoughts, to look forward. His gaze was upon Christ. In 2021, it's my hope that we'll have our gaze upon God. We'll set our eyes and our aim upon kingdom hopes. Well, Isaiah chapter 43 gives us a ton of hope that God can do a new thing, then it's found in Jesus. If you've studied with us in our past series, the Adore series, we kind of journeyed through the prophet's words in Isaiah about Jesus. And we got a vision for him as Emmanuel, God with us, a vision for him to bring peace here on earth, a vision of the Savior, of Messiah. Well, today I want us to stay in Isaiah and we're going to see a hope for new things that are found here. It's a big, long passage, so hang with me as I read it with you. Verse 1, and this is out of the CSB version. It says, Now this is what the Lord says, The one who created you, Jacob, and the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, and the rivers will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Seba in your place, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I will give people in exchange for you, and nations instead of your life. Do not fear, for I'm with you. I'll bring you and your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I'll say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who bears my name is created 
for my and who is created for my glory, I have formed them. Indeed, I have made them. Bring out a people who are blind and yet have eyes, are deaf and yet hear with their ears. Verse 9 says, All the nations are gathered together and the peoples are assembled. Who among them can declare this and tell us from the former things? Let them present their witness to vindicate themselves so that the people may hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God, lowercase God here, no God was formed before me and there will be none after me. I, I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no savior. I alone declared, saved and proclaimed and not some foreign God among you. So you are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration. I am God. Also, from today on, I am he alone, and none can rescue from my power. I act, and who can reverse it? This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says, because of you, I will send an army to Babylon, and I'll bring all of them as fugitives, even the Chaldeans in the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. This is what the Lord says, who makes a way in the sea and a path through raging water, who brings out the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty one together. They lie down. They do not rise again. They are extinguished, put out like a wick. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Look, I'm about to do something new. Even now, it is coming. Do you see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Wild animals, jackals, and ostriches will honor me because I provide water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people I formed for myself will declare my praise. But Jacob, you have not called on me because Israel, you have become weary of me. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or Wearied you with incense. You have not bought me an aromatic cane with silver or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sin and you have wearied me with your iniquities. I'm the one. I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake and remember your sins no more. Remind me. Let's argue the case together. Recount the facts so that you may be vindicated. Your first father sinned and your mediators have rebelled against me. So I defiled the officers of the sanctuary and set Jacob apart for destruction and Israel for scorn. Well, the last part of this section of scripture leads us to the judgment that God had placed upon Israel, that he had placed upon Jacob. This is a passage of scripture that deals with the 70th year of captivity that was seen as almost over. Judah's, Judah's exile to Babylon, it was drawing to a close. If you read in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 2, the Lord was raising up a leader to free them that we see in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 2 through 4 and verse 25. God promises that he'll give them the Messiah for a spiritual release in chapter 42, verses 1 through 17. And he gives instructions here in Isaiah 43 to the nations not to fear. He gave instructions to the nation not to fear, but to look forward. And in chapter 44, if you read ahead in verses 23 through 45, you'll see that God's raising up Cyrus, the Persians, to deliver Israel from Babylon in captivity. Now, each of these 
sections can be broken up in verses 1 through 27 to give us a better understanding of what the Lord was going to do and really has done as we're on the other side of the coin here in human history. The first thing I want you to see is verses 1 through 7. Israel is commanded not to fear. The second section of scripture in Isaiah 43, the thing that I want you to see is Israel will be an, a witness to the world, to the entire world in verses 8 through 13. The third section that we're going to talk about is Israel is promised a deliverer from Babylon, that they will be delivered from Babylon in verses 14 through 21. And finally, in closing, verses 23 through 20 or 22 through 28, Israel will be delivered by God's grace. Well, let's look at verses 1 through 7, first and foremost together. We see that Israel is commanded not to fear. In 2021, the command not to fear still rings true for us today. We're still called upon by God to face our trials and circumstances, and the structure of life should be based upon living in trusting the Lord, to not fear. It's still one of the greatest commands all throughout Scripture. Listed over 300 times, do not fear in some way or another in both the Old Testament and the New. In verses 1 through 2, I, Isaiah says these words again. He says, now this is what the Lord says, the one who created you. That's part of the platform for which God commands us not to fear is that the one who created us in life, he's got it under control. He is our heavenly father. He says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I've called you by your name and your mind. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you and the rivers will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you, want, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. The word fear here in the Hebrew, it's a state of feeling. It's a state of feeling of great distress or maybe deep concern over unfavorable circumstances. And so when we face an unfavorable circumstance or we face a moment where we feel great distress, the Lord is speaking into our lives and he's actually commanding us not to fear. Why? Because... He's the Redeemer. He is the great Redeemer. The word Redeemer in the Hebrew here has this idea of moving out of a dangerous situation. And very specifically, it means to purchase out of slavery, to buy out of slavery. I would say that that is a dangerous situation. So we are commanded not to fear because the God who created us and formed us, who set this world into motion, he has redeemed us. He has bought us out of a dangerous situation. In fact, he calls us by name. Look in that passage again. It says that Israel, that they were called by name, each and every one of them. And for believers today, we're called by name as well too. We have a special relationship with God. To be called by name means you are known. I like going to restaurants and certain business establishments where they end up knowing my name. It's got that cheers effect where you walk in and they say hello. It instantly puts you at ease and you feel like more than a customer. You feel like you're a part of the family. And so to be called by name gives you a sense of value. And you feel accepted. And God says, I know you by name. I've called you by name. And Israel had a special relationship with God. And through the Messiah, this relationship that Israel had, we can have with God as well. It's made available for all. But look again in verses 3 through 4. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One, and your Savior. Circle those three descriptive terms talking about God. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel and your Savior. I've given Egypt as a ransom for you and Cush and Zeba in your place because you are precious in my sight and honored. And I love you. I will give people in exchange for you and nations instead of your life. 
Uh, this word ransom could mean a reward, in fact. Compensation for a wrongdoing that's taken place. And so Persia was enabled by God to conquer Egypt down to Kush, modern, modern day southern Egypt, all the way to the Sudan and, and the northern parts here. And, and that release that Israel is going to feel from the bondage of Babylon, it's going to come through God's gift, that ransom to Persia in victory over them so that they could exile, they could leave exile, go back to their homeland. God promised to bring Israel back to their land. And though Isaiah was speaking of Israel's return to the promised land, he was also speaking of a wider gathering that would take place for all of believers at the return of Christ. Well, the second section of scripture here tells us that Israel will be a witness to the whole world. And for us as believers, we ought to be a witness to the whole world for God's goodness of how he's ransomed us, how he knows us by name, and we have a relationship with him. In verse 8, it says, Bring out a people who are blind, yet have eyes, and are deaf, and yet have ears. We see that God is going to give sight to the blind, and he is going to bring hearing to the deaf. Those who cannot spiritually see or hear will be given spiritual sight and have ears to hear spiritually. Verses 9 through 10, all the nations are gathered together and the peoples are assembled. Who among them can declare this and tell us the former things? Let them present and bring their witnesses to vindicate themselves so that people may hear and say, it is true. Bring them on. Bring other people around. But look what verse 10 says. You you are my witness. If you share a special relationship with God, you get to be an ambassador here on earth for the kingdom of God. You can be a witness. This is my declaration and my own servant whom I've chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No lowercase God was formed before me and there will be none after me. This is a uppercase God who is in control, the beginning and the end. And throughout human history, there will be false gods, lowercase gods that will arise. But no one can bear witness. No one can speak of their great work because it's empty. But we, as followers of God, the people of God, we will be able to bear witness to the one true God, to speak of his goodness Gods of other nations and idol worshipers will not be able to predict the future or be able to predict how God will be able to bring a new hope for the future. And you've got a lot of people that are trying to pontificate on what's going to happen in 2021. Forecasters financially, political gurus, leaders of nations trying to tell each of us what 2021 is going to look like and what it could look like, but we don't turn to those leaders in our life for direction for the future. We turn to God. We don't turn to leaders in our life to find our hope. We turn to God to find our hope. He's the one who knows the future, to knows what's in front of us, to know he's the one who knows what 2021 will hold. And just like verses 9 through 10, today we ought to look to God to lead us into the future. Israel, they'll get to be a witness, according to verse 10, his chosen servant to demonstrate that he really is the one true God. Think about in 2021 how your life can reflect and point others to God. See yourself as an instrument to demonstrate that people can find hope in Christ. In 2021, see yourself as an instrument used by God to demonstrate how people can turn their eyes upon God. Well, verses 11 through 13 talk about why we would do such a thing. Because he's our Savior. Because he cares about us and can rescue us. Verse 11 again, together. I am the Lord. Besides me, there's no Savior. I alone declared, saved, and proclaimed, and not some foreign God among you, so you are my witness 
This is the Lord's declaration, and I am God also from today on, and he alone, I and he alone, and none can rescue from my power. I act, and who can reverse it? Oh, no one can reverse what the Lord does. He is our Savior, the only one who can save. Look with me at this word Savior in the Hebrew. It means deliverer rescuer. One who delivers an object from danger to a point of safety, usually physical or even in the context of military violence. So Israel was able to hear these words from the prophet Isaiah coming to the close of the 70th year of captivity in Babylon, where God had already told them through the prophet Jeremiah, build houses Stay in that city, do good for the city, have families. It won't be like that forever, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. The hope and the future were just on the horizon in Isaiah 43. And he, that Savior, would rescue them and deliver them from the physical threats of being in exile sending them back to their homeland. But a bigger picture, a a view of him as a religious deliverer is a title that's given to God with a focus on the relationship between God and those whom he delivers. But it does not preclude, it doesn't eliminate the only only the idea of physical, that, that it's more than physical. He can deliver us from our physical struggles, and he can also deliver us, more importantly, from our spiritual struggles. James Swanson, from the Dictionary of Biblical Languages, gives us such a great picture there, doesn't he, about what it means to have God as a Savior. In 2021, I'm sure there's a lot of things. Getting back to work, being physically healthy, having a nation that's not on pins and needles, but really, truly being free again. Hopes and dreams physically that you might have. Can God deliver us? I believe he can. We can ask for him to do so. But the greater thought and the greater question leads us to, are we going through something physically so that God can change lives spiritually? So my prayer for our country for the whole world, is that God would use the desperation that we sense physically to be done with COVID-19 to bring about deliverance in people's lives spiritually. Only God can redeem and save 2021. Only God can rescue us from whatever 2021 has in store for us. Many of us have already figured out a new routine, how to adapt, homeschool, work, COVID restrictions, social distancing, and we've developed a new routine. But we must not put our hope in that new routine. We must put our hope in God and trust that he's really the one capable of rescuing us and saving us from a wild 2021, I'm sure. He promised that for Israel, to deliver them, to save them. And I'm praying to a God who did that for Israel and asking him to do the same for us. Well, Israel was actually promised a deliverer through Cyrus, a deliverer from Babylon. Verses 14 through 21 lay that out for us. Look in verses 14 and 15 with me real quick again. This is what the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel says, because of you, I'll send an army to Babylon and bring all of them as fugitives, even the Chaldeans and their ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel. This is what the Lord says. That phrase, that stresses the authority of who is saying it. Isaiah is saying, these aren't just my words. This is what the Lord says. I'm placing the authority upon Israel. Him, the holy authority, the whole holy authority as our Redeemer, the holy authority as our Lord, the holy authority, authority as our Holy One, the holy authority as our Creator, the holy authority as our King. That's who's saying this. 
who's saying that you'll be delivered, that you'll be delivered from King Cyrus and the Persians will set you free from your captivity. And now the captors, they will become the captive. That's the reversal that takes place. And you'll be free to go back and worship the Lord your God. In verses 16 through 21, what we really see here is a new exodus, an exodus out of exile back to the promised land. God promises to do a new work in Isaiah chapter 43. What do you think the new thing, the new work will be for us in 2021? I'm believing that the church has positioned itself to have an explosion of growth in the future that we have loved for and cared for our neighbors and supported our neighbors. And that through this season of isolation, that many are are turning their hearts back towards God. And I believe that the new thing, and I'm praying that the new thing would be that God would multiply the church, that it would grow and that more lives would be transformed by him. Well, the word and phrase new work here could be translated into new thing. And it's a fresh, new, or renewing work. You can go back to old school DC talk. You know who's doing it? Yo, who's doing it? God is doing a new thing. If you don't know that song, you just dive in, Google it, and have some fun with some early Christian rap. See, the new thing that he was promising Israel was that new exodus to be set free from captivity. Wouldn't it be great in 2021 to ask God to do a new thing, to do a new work, to set people free from their captivity to sin, and now be set free into a relationship with God? In Isaiah 43, verse 19, it says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness in, and rivers, they'll rise up in the desert. I know for certain that 2021, God has many things in store, many things planned. I know that there is new hope that 2021 can bring. But most of all, I firmly believe that he wants to take people through that journey, that exodus out of their spiritual captivity. And it'll feel like they're going through a desert and a season of dryness. And God will lead them to those fresh waters in the desert to do a new thing, to take them back to the promised land. He is at work in our world and all around us. Let's have more stories like Claudia's baptism in 2021. Let's have more stories of of you being a witness to speak on behalf of God's goodness and his glory as a redemptive savior. And that maybe you might even in 2021 be used by God as an instrument to lead someone to the Lord, that they could cross that line of faith by hearing your testimony and story of how he rescued you and matching that with the scriptures to find, maybe even follow the Roman road to where they can discover for themselves that by faith, they can be saved because of God's goodness and his grace. Wouldn't that be something? You know, we must trust that God is working out the circumstances of life to draw people to himself, that he is allowing certain things to happen like this pandemic. He's allowing people to lose their jobs. He's allowing governments to issue more control over their citizens. He he literally is allowing all of that to take place. But we must trust that as he allows it, that he's doing a work within it to lead people to dependence upon him. They'll find that the government will fail them. And if they place their dependence upon the government to save them and rescue them, they will be sorry. But in that moment, they could discover that they must place their dependence upon something greater, something higher. They could have an exodus spiritually away from darkness and into light, that they could have an exodus out of the desert to a promised land. You know, there will be another final exodus 
at the return of Christ, the Messiah will return and he'll gather his people. In chapter 43, verses 5 through 6, we see that the north, the south, the east, and the west, he's going to have a gathering and he's going to establish his millennial reign on earth. You don't want to be one of those who's left behind. You want to be one of those who is a part of the family of God. And it only comes, that deliverance only comes through God's grace. Even here in Isaiah 43, verses 22 through 28, we see that to be true, that religious sacrifices, acts of prayer, incense offerings, it won't bring about or stir God towards that new work. No, the forgiveness and the moving away from spiritual darkness to light and away from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, that that will only come by God's grace, that only God can forgive. And he would do that for his glory, for their benefit, but for his own namesake. Look again in verse 25 here. Verse 25 gives us that final picture in Isaiah 43, that we can be delivered by God's grace. He says, I am the one, not you, not your works, not your best efforts. I am the one. I sweep away your transgressions for my own sake. And I I remember your sin no more. See, God forgives us today through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his son. And he does this for his name's sake. He does this not because we have done something to earn it, but he does it for his glory, for his name's sake. So we don't get the glory or credit for salvation. He does. Oh, we certainly benefit from his glory being executed by redeeming us and forgiving us and saving us from our sins. In 2021, do you have your eyes and your aim set upon the Savior, the Rescuer, the Holy One, the One who can save you from your sin? Do you have your gaze fixed upon God? Are you resting in the beauty of His grace? Do you trust that he's at work and that 2021 he can and will move for his own namesake, that he can and he will operate in such a way that draws people to himself. Will you trust that the current circumstances that feel a lot like being exiled like Israel, that we're on the cusp, we're getting very close to being set free from it, but that he's at work, he's got a plan. And it's all so that he can show his love, his kindness, his goodness, his glory, and his grace. You see, it's by grace through faith that we can be saved. And it's by God's grace that we can have true faith that he will save us and rescue us. So step into 2021 with a redeemed vision for your life. It's a new year and a new start. Sure, you might have some goals. Last year, I did one push-up for every calendar year of the day. This year, I'm going to try squats. I don't know if I can make it on that. You might have physical goals, financial goals. You might have relational goals to date your spouse once a week or to spend time writing a handwritten letter to people and encouraging them every single month. But I would challenge you to have a redeemed vision for your life. Set your gaze upon God. Maybe set some spiritual goals and resolutions for a new year and a new start that could align you better to see clearly with spiritual eyes, to hear clearly with spiritual ears. Maybe it's to memorize scripture, to read the Bible. Maybe it's to share your faith. What kind of spiritual goal would you have for this year? Do you have a redeemed vision? For 2021, I'm thankful that the Lord gave us Isaiah 43 to remind us that it's not always going to be this way. The gloom won't always be this way. He'll save us from it. He'll rescue us from it. 
And we can fix our eyes upon the one who does that work for his goodness and for his glory and for our good. He's going to do a new thing. Let's have a redeemed vision for 2021. Thanks for joining us.